Good afternoon, everyone. I see it's uh, three o'clock and I think we're ready to get started. I'm going to ask the presenters to turn uh, their cameras on so folks can see everybody. And uh, Josh and Patricia, are we ready to get started? Good. I see we're probably still waiting for um, some registrants to join, but uh, it's uh, just after three, so I think we'll get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Kendra Nixon, and I'm the director of the Resolve Network. On behalf of Resolve, I would like to uh, welcome everyone to uh, today's uh, webinar. Today's webinar is entitled COVID-19, The Shadow Pandemic and Access to Justice for Survivors of Domestic Violence. Okay, next, Patricia. Um, before we begin the presentation, I do want to um, acknowledge the, the land that we're meeting on today. I would like to recognize that even though we are meeting remotely, uh, we and we are scattered across the three prairie provinces, it is very important that we acknowledge the land that we are meeting on today. So for myself personally, um, I'm at home in Winnipeg and the Resolve Manitoba office is housed at the University of Manitoba, which is located on Treaty 1 territory. Recognizing that I'm a visitor on this land and that Indigenous peoples have an inherent rights because they are First Peoples, it's an important step in reconciliation to acknowledge this, this land. So with that, I would like to acknowledge that the University of Manitoba campuses, oh, can you turn it back, please? The University of Manitoba campuses are located on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. And again, I've said the, you know, the land that I am meeting on today, again, we're meeting across uh, the prairies. So if you could think, uh, you know, take a little bit of time to think about the lands that you are on um, uh, yourselves today. Thanks, Patricia. Next. Before we begin uh, today's presentation, which will go to 4.30 uh, this afternoon, I do want to um, acknowledge some very important people for helping make this webinar uh, a huge success. First of all, uh, to the University of Manitoba for um, supporting the work that we do, um, and especially for the project that this relates to, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, special thanks to our uh, five presenters today. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing your presentations, as well as uh, University of Manitoba IST staff, uh, including Josh, who's the IT person that's with us today, uh, as well as Patricia Kirasoni. Patricia is our digital communication specialist, and she does all the wonderful social media and did all the planning for today's event, as well as Renee Hofford, who is a research associate with Resolve and is the project coordinator for this project, and who was also instrumental in helping organize uh, today's uh, webinar event. Next. So before we uh, begin the presentation, we'll just say a little bit about um, how we're meeting on Zoom today. So um, you will all remain muted and have your video turned off. It will really only be the presenters who um, will be sharing their uh, either their screens and their videos and uh, um, will not be muted. We will have a about a 15, 20 minute question and answer, <clears throat> excuse me, session at the end. And you'll be able to type in your questions in the Q&A panel. I will serve as the moderator and uh, I'll address those questions to our five uh, presenters today. Please note that the webinar is recorded. Um, and I will ask maybe Patricia after at the at the end to talk about um, how you can access the webinar recording. As well, I'll just say a little bit about um, this project. This project <clears throat> is part of a or this webinar is part of a larger project that Resolve is involved in. The project is called Supporting the Health of Survivors of Family Violence and Family Law Proceedings. It is a three-year project that we're conducting alongside Western University. Western University in London, Ontario is the lead um, 
uh, applicant on this grant, and they are carrying out this project uh, in partnership with um, Resolve, as well as the other uh, three Alliance uh, research centers across Canada. So uh, we have a sister center uh, in New Brunswick, Quebec, Western, uh, in London, Ontario, us, the Prairie Provinces, as well as the Frida Center in um, BC. So working, we're all working on this project together, and it's looking at um, family law and family court responses to intimate partner violence. And so a purpose, one of the, the goals of the project is really to enhance support for survivors of intimate partner violence. And we're doing that by providing training, guidance, and resources to family law practitioners, and um, uh, those working in the uh, violence against women, intimate partner violence um, sector, including counselors, as well as shelters and, and women's resource centers. We also want to improve coordination of services and sectors that will ultimately enhance the safety and well-being of all parties. So uh, one way we're doing that is hosting regular webinar events. Um, so I think this is maybe our uh, fourth webinar that um, the project has hosted with, and we're planning to do 10 a year. So please stay uh, tuned and kind of, and, and we'll keep you informed of future uh, webinars related to this particular project. As well, we are producing research briefs for all of the webinars and all of the research that we're doing. So in the next little while, we will be sending out a research brief about a two-page document that will share the findings of today's presentation for you. Okay, next, Patricia. So here is our, our schedule. Again, we will um, go till uh, 4.30 today. We'll start with a presentation uh, from Jennifer, Janet, and Wanda, followed by a presentation from Paula and Zara. And then, as I said, a uh, about a 15 to 20 minute question, uh, question and answer period. And then we'll do some quick closing remarks. We will um, follow this up with a brief survey that we would ask all of you complete um, as part of the funding for this project, which is through the Public Health Agency of Canada, we're expected to provide an evaluation of all the webinars. So Patricia will be sending out a link for that survey um, after the event today. Thank you. Um, next, Patricia. So today I am uh, I have the pleasure of welcoming our first three presenters, uh, Jennifer Kashan, Janet Mosher, and Wanda Wagers. Um, I'm not going to go through all of their bios uh, word for word, but maybe just quite briefly. Uh, and perhaps if the presenters want to say a little bit more, they can do that. Um, I've known Jennifer a long time in our work with Resolve, and I'm thrilled that she's here today. Uh, Jennifer is a professor in the Faculty of Law at University of Calgary, and her research and teaching focuses on equality and human rights and legal responses to interpersonal violence. Janet uh, Mosher is an associate professor at Osgoode Law School, Ho Osgoode Hall Law School at York University. She's the co-founder and current co-director of the Feminist Advocacy Ending Violence Against Women clinical program that runs in partnership with the Barbara Schleifer Commemorative Clinic. Uh, also, Wanda, Weiger Wanda Wagers. Wanda is a professor with the College of Law, University of Saskatchewan. She teaches prim primarily in the area of family law and her research interests focus on family law, children and the law, domestic violence, feminist and critical theory, and poverty, economic equality, and the law. So again, I'm thrilled to um, introduce uh, Jennifer, Janet, and Wanda. Next. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I know we have some slides to uh, put up, so I'll just wait for those to um, get up on the screen. Um, and great, here we go. Uh, so thank you very much for the invitation to participate in today's webinar. I'm very pleased to join my uh, co-authors in presenting research that we completed uh, last summer. I'm going to begin with an overview of the interplay between COVID-19 and gender-based violence, and then briefly highlight COVID's impact on the various services that are both essential to women's safety and bear on legal processes. And Jennifer and Wanda will share findings from our case law review, and then I'll provide some concluding comments and offer our thoughts about future research questions. On April the 5th, 2020, UN Secretary General 
Gutierrez observed that many women under lockdown face violence where they should be safest and urged all governments to put women's safety first as they respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. In our project, we were interested in assessing how Canada had fared in putting women's safety first as governments, federal, provincial, territorial, responded to the COVID-19 pandemic. Our assessment was focused on women's access to justice, including not only meaningful access to the courts and to legal assistance, but more substantively, we were concerned to try to find out whether decisions reflected an understanding and appropriate weighing of the risks of domestic violence during the COVID pandemic. Now, our research covered the early weeks of the COVID pandemic, um, beginning March 16th, 2020, precisely a year ago uh, to June 1st, 2020. And our focus was on those areas of law that survivors must most frequently navigate, family, child protection, criminal, and civil protection. New slide. Just a brief word about the shadow pandemic. Um, as early as 2014, UN women used the term pandemic to capture the global pervasiveness and harms of violence against women and girls. The term shadow pandemic has been used more recently to capture the notion that there are two global pandemics wrecking havoc on the world at present, COVID-19 and gender-based violence. New slide. Although COVID public health messaging consistently portrayed and portrays uh, the home as the place of safety, as UN Secretary General Gutierrez and countless others have observed, in fact, for many women and children, the home is not a safe place. Across a great many different sources of reporting, the calls to shelters, to police, to hotlines, surveys of service providers, of women, increases have been documented in both the prevalence and severity of domestic violence, which reflects the way in which these two pandemics interact. Reported increases in prevalence vary widely, but many fall in the range of 30 to 60 percent. And increases in severity include reports regarding increases in strangulation, deaths, and hospital ER trauma cases. Just by way of example, police in Saskatoon reported 484 domestic violence calls in March 2020 by comparison to 359 in March 2019. And the Vancouver Battered Women's Support Services reported in early April 2020 a 300% increase in calls over the prior three-week period. Uh, research examining the impacts on the violence experienced by women at the intersections of multiple systems of oppression shows especially acute impacts for Indigenous women, non-status women, women with disabilities, and low-income women. We also know that they've borne a disproportionate burden of COVID-19 in terms of rates of infection and morbidity and in terms of job loss. The Native Women's Association of Canada's survey conducted in May 2020 of 750 Indigenous women and gender diverse people found that they were more worried about domestic violence than about COVID. They experienced more violence during COVID than usual, and the most vulnerable to violence were those in the North under 34 years of age and who had been financially impacted by COVID. Given what we know about the correlation between domestic violence and many of the consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic, for example, increases in unemployment, insecurity, isolation, et cetera, the increases in domestic violence and its severity are not unanticipated. The confluence of factors, isolation paired with psychological and economic stressors and increases in negative coping mechanisms have been variously described as you'll see on the slide, a ticking time bomb, a powder keg and a perfect storm. New slide. We've included here the definition of family violence from the Act to Amend the Divorce Act, which came into effect very recently on March 1st, 2021. And no doubt it will be familiar to many of you. Uh, there has been a long concern across many different areas of law and certainly in the family law context that courts and legal counsel have operated from a narrow conceptualization of domestic violence or family violence as discrete incidents of physical violence, obscuring the range of tactics and behaviors that in many contexts abusers use to control, intimidate, coerce, and harm their partners. 
BC's family law reforms of 2011 explicitly recognized coercive controlling violence, and certainly some judges in various parts of the country have done so in recent years. But significantly, the Divorce Act no, now does so as well, adopting a definition of family violence that includes not only violent or threatening behavior, but also conduct that constitutes a pattern of coercive and controlling behavior. Next slide. Uh, we've included here um, just a, a, a list of the various COVID specific tactics of coercion and control that have been documented in the literature. Uh, the citation we've provided is to a piece of Australian research, but these tactics um, specific to uh, COVID um, have been documented in other literature. And we were interested to know whether these behaviors were emerging in the case law um, and if so, whether they were being tied to a framework of coercive control. Next slide. Uh, as part of our project, we attempted to map COVID's impact on a range of services that are important to survivors' safety and well-being, and which also frequently bear directly or indirectly on legal proceedings, including on the ability of women to access the sorts of evidence that courts often insist upon to prove or verify domestic violence. Of various important services were deemed essential, uh, including courts, in most parts of the country, uh, violence against women shelters and frontline VAW providers, but many services were not available or were available on only a limited basis. Uh, and the impact of this on judicial decision-making will become apparent when Jennifer and Wanda review the case law. Uh, I also wanna flag that services were and remain differentially available for women who are uh, locked inside of their homes with their abuser, um, the ability to access uh, the technology to engage in, for example, remote counseling uh, to secure remote advice from a lawyer is difficult, if not impossible. Moreover, a very significant digital divide has been documented. Um, so many women do not have access to the technology or to the broadband internet that they need in order to be able to access services or engage in um, court proceedings remotely. The other general observation to note here are differences across the country. And one in particular that stands out relates to changes in access to and eligibility for legally aided services. And the, and the ability to access these kinds of services, of course, is especially important during um, the COVID pandemic, given the complexities of proceeding remotely and given the need in many areas of law to establish urgency as a precondition to accessing the courts. From our early assessment, it appears that in some provinces, no changes were made um, other than to end in-person services. Some, like British Columbia, updated public legal education materials to include information about how to secure protection orders remotely. Alberta extended duty council services to facilitate access to protection orders, including by phone. And Ontario waived all financial and eligibility criteria for domestic violence survivors. So now I'm going to turn things uh, over to uh, Jennifer to introduce the methodology for the case law search. Thanks very much, Janet. So um, as Janet mentioned, um, in addition to looking at government services, we looked at case law across Canada. And the reason we wanted to look at case law, first of all, is, is that domestic violence obviously um, engages the courts, and specifically in the areas of family law, child welfare, criminal law, and then the law related to civil protection and restraining orders. And so what we wanted to see across the cases was whether the risks of both domestic violence and of contracting COVID-19 were being identified by the courts, and if so, how were these issues being dealt with? We also wanted to examine more broadly how access to justice by survivors was being affected during the pandemic. So for example, in their access to courts, um, in light of court directives that uh, they would only hear urgent matters. And that's something that, that Wanda will be talking about. 
um, and also how access to justice was potentially being affected in light of challenges in gathering and presenting evidence, as, as Janet mentioned. Lastly, we wanted to assess what approaches to the issues were either helpful or problematic for litigants uh, in different areas of law. So in terms of our methodology, we searched all Canadian court decisions, so, so cases at the provincial court, territorial court, superior court, and appellate court levels, uh, between March 16, 2020, so the beginning of the lockdown, and June 1, 2020. We used Canly, which is an open access database, and our search terms uh, included terms referencing both domestic or family violence, uh, as well as COVID-19 and the pandemic in both English and in French. Our search uh, produced only 20, or, sorry, only 67 cases in about a 10 week period of time in which domestic violence was either alleged or found to have occurred and in which COVID-19 was relevant to hearing the case or deciding the case on the merits. Uh, we also noted up the cases that we initially found and included any subsequent decisions in the same case in our analysis. And you can see the numbers of cases there on the slide. Um, apart from Ontario, really, what's significant is that there were very few reported cases in many jurisdictions across Canada and no reported decisions in Saskatchewan, Manitoba, New Brunswick, PEI, uh, or any of the territories. So I know our focus today is on domestic violence across the Prairie Provinces, but, but I think it's important to note right at the outset, we have very limited case law that we can discuss that's, that's specific to the Prairie Provinces. Um, and what are, what are some of the reasons for the potential, uh, une well, for the, what are some of the potential reasons, I should say, for the unequal distribution in the numbers that we see here? Um, one explanation is that there were higher case numbers where the, there was a higher incidence um, or rate of COVID-19 infection. So in the more populous regions like Ontario and Quebec, uh, but that still doesn't explain why Ontario has so many more cases than, than Quebec, for example. Um, it's also possible that there were fewer written decisions uh, being rendered or reported in some jurisdictions. And we think that in itself is an access to justice issue uh, when we think about the need for transparency and accountability of courts and the guidance that courts provide to other litigants as well as to researchers who are looking for systemic trends. Another possibility uh, is that the other barriers to access to justice uh, affected the ability of litigants to access the courts. So Janet mentioned the availability of, of legal aid in some provinces. Um, there may also be different availability of things like EPO uh, or emergency protection orders. And I'll be talking more about that later. Um, there was also talk about concerns on the part of both litigants and lawyers that they wouldn't meet the urgency thresholds that the, the courts had established. Um, and as well, there was a lack of access to other services uh, which, as Janet mentioned, are often very important for corroborating domestic violence um, and the impacts that it has on children. Um, so I will now turn it over to Wanda to talk about the family law cases. Uh, hello. Um, so out of uh, the 67 cases in our sample, uh, 43 of these were family law cases. And the majority, about 38, of these cases dealt with applications under the Divorce Act or under um, provincial statutes for custody and access, uh, which are now referred to under the amended Divorce Act as parenting orders. In making custody and access or parenting orders under these statutes, judges must consider only the best interests of the children in question. So that's the basis upon which a parentage or parenting order is made. And in deciding what is in their best interests, judges have generally accepted that a child's exposure to family violence can be relevant. 
However, the Divorce Act during the time frame of our sample did not define family violence nor expressly require consideration of family violence as it now does, as Janet pointed out uh, in her presentation. So new slide. So um, as a result of the pandemic and the closure of court facilities, court directives or notices to the profession were issued across the country. And these directives generally limited the matters that judges would hear to urgent or emergency situations. So on the overhead, we reference the Ontario Superior Courts Directive as of March 17th, 2020, because it was similar to the notice that was used in some other jurisdictions. And it defined as urgent, as you'll see on the overhead, urgent relief relating to the safety of a child or parent. That could be an application for restraining order, or exclusive possession orders. Um, relief related to the well-being of a child, and that would include the wrongful removal or retention of a child, and, quote, uh, dire issues regarding the fin party's financial circumstances. Um, for example, orders that would prevent the depletion of assets by one party. So these directives varied to some degree according to the court, uh, the region, and the time period. Now, of the should mention as well that of the 43 cases in our sample, the vast majority involved allegations that women were making of domestic violence against men. Uh, abuse by the mother or mutual abuse was alleged only in five cases of our sample. And all of the cases involved heterosexual relationships and most were decided in Ontario. So next slide. As a result of the pandemic, courts in parenting cases had to determine two issues. So the first issue was, was the matter sufficiently urgent for a hearing to proceed or should it be adjourned as with other family law applications to be dealt with at a later date? If the urgency threshold was met, the second issue was what order was then in the best interests of the child. In Ontario, a triage judge decided the first issue um, and these urgency rulings were typically identified as being without prejudice to further resolution of the dispute. Orders in Ontario were identified as temporary at this stage, and in other jurisdictions were identified as interim, which is an order, an interim order is an order that has effect pending a trial when a more complete evidentiary record is typically available. So now, uh, just to review a number of the key principles that were identified in the cases and are itemized on the slide. Uh, Thomas and Wool Lieber has been frequently cited in Ontario for establishing what is needed to meet the threshold requirement of urgency. Um, so the matter at issue must be immediate, serious, definite and material, that is tangible and not speculative, and it must be clearly particularized in evidence. This requirement was also to be scrupulously and rigorously enforced, and the onus of proving ur urgency is typically on the party advancing the motion with, each, with respect to each claim of relief that they make. Now, while more research is, no, is needed, there is a concern, as, Janet, as Jennifer mentioned, um, that the stringency of this test may have deterred some people who were experiencing domestic violence from proceeding with their claims. We also noted in our paper that the requirements set out in Thomas are clearly most easily met where there is serious um, financial coercion. And in Thomas, the husband had unilaterally withdrawn over $700,000 from the party's joint line of credit or when a relatively severe incident of physical violence has recently occurred. As such, the emphasis in Thomas on material or tangible and immediate matters can reinforce a tendency that has been long noted in cases involving domestic violence and that Janet uh, highlighted in her remarks. And that is the tendency for judges to focus on discrete incidents of physical violence and pay inadequate attention to coercive control. Now, many of the decisions that we looked at only vaguely referenced allegations of controlling behavior or emotional or psychological abuse. 
there were allegations in some cases of specific behavior that was suggestive of, con of coercive control, but it was not identified in such terms, nor analyzed in light of such a possibility. And these allegations included, for example, efforts uh, to undermine the relationships that mothers had with their children by refusing to return children to a mother, alleging non-compliance with COVID protocols, or accusing her of substance abuse or having mental health issues and being incapable of caring for the children, as well as electronic surveillance, a failure to abide by previous orders and threats of numerous lawsuits. Such allegations were generally not analyzed within a frame of coercive and controlling violence. Now, moving along to the second point on the overhead, the presumption that pre-existing parenting orders should be complied with. The case of Ribeiro and Wright, noted on the overhead, did not involve domestic violence, but it did establish general principles that have been widely cited in Ontario in Ontario cases and by courts in Saskatchewan, Alberta, and BC. In Ribeiro, the mother applied to suspend the parenting time a father had under a prior court order because she believed he would not comply with social distancing. Now, Justice Pazaratz found that the mother's application was not urgent and could not proceed. Courts have made it very clear in Ribeiro and since that specific evidence of conduct inconsistent with the protocols and that has placed a child or another household member at risk must be produced. Absent such evidence, children must continue to move between the two households. Now, a presumption in favor of compliance with pre-existing orders can discourage those experiencing domestic violence from seeking changes to orders where safety issues arise, or it can increase pressure on them to agree to unsafe modifications, of, for example, non-neutral supervisors or unsafe exchange locations. I've also cited the case of AMD and KG on the overhead. And this is an Alberta case uh, in which the court referenced the concept of the status quo in its consideration of an interim order. The status quo refers to the parenting arrangement that either existed before separation or that after separation became settled by way of an order agreement or by acquiescence of the parties to a settled pattern. And according to this principle, maintaining the status quo where one can be established is generally in the best interests of children on an interim basis because it will preserve stability for them and minimize disruptions in their care pending a final order at trial. So domestic violence can provide a compelling reason to change pre-established parenting arrangements. However, survivors typically bear the burden of proving domestic violence in order to alter a status quo. And proving domestic violence is difficult where it's denied or criminal charges have not yet been prosecuted, and even more difficult as we discuss shortly during a pandemic. You know, in terms of settlement, moving on, courts have encouraged the settlement of parenting matters in a number of different ways over the last several decades. But during the time frame of our sample, parties in their counsel were generally expected to an even greater extent to try to work things out on their own. In Ribeiro, the courts um, expected the parties to, quote, have made good faith efforts to communicate, to show mutual respect, and to come up with creative and realistic proposals which demonstrate both parental insight and COVID-19 awareness, end quote. So these expectations can be wholly inappropriate where domestic violence has been alleged and can end up compromising safety as well as the substantive fairness of settlement outcomes. Government websites in, in Ontario during this time also encouraged the use of mediation, which was available virtually, uh, though they cautioned that it may not be safe in situations of family violence. Uh, mediators are increasingly aware of the importance of screening and monitoring for domestic violence and power imbalances. And while screening may be attempted online, recent Australian research that we note actually in the next overhead, um, but has noted concerns that clients may not have enough privacy to feel safe in fully sharing their fears online, and mediators may be less able to pick up on visual cues 
in screening and in monitoring for power imbalances. So finally, uh, in terms of the key principles and their implications, maximum contact uh, was intensified. An emphasis on maximum contact and fostering a child's relationship with both parents has been a dominant norm in parenting cases since the 1980s. And this orientation was evident in many different ways in our sample. First, it was evident in the assumption readily made in Ribeiro that it was permissible for a child to continue to move between two households even though public health protocols generally required or recommended that contact be limited to the members of one's immediate household. Um, as indicated above, uh, findings of urgency based on a child's well-being were also particularly likely where a party had failed to provide access or failed to return a child in violation of an order. In the absence of an order, the results of applications by alleged perpetrators of domestic violence for parenting time or access were mixed. In some applications, the matter was not seen as urgent because the children were safe in the mother's care and there had been delays in the application. In others, however, the matter was seen to be urgent because the allegations of domestic violence had not been proven and parenting time with both parents was assumed to be in the children's best interests. Where those alleging domestic violence sought and obtained custody or access, uh, interestingly, courts tended to frame the problematic conduct of the other parent in terms other than domestic violence. For example, a father's behavior that was undermining a mother's relationship with the children tended to be characterized as alienation rather than as a tactic of coercive control. It might also be framed as conduct that exposed a child to parental conflict or as behavior that disrupted the child's attachment to their primary parent, all of which generally reflect, again, a concern with maximizing contact or promoting the relationship between the child and both parents. Finally, the emphasis on contact is reflected in the fact that where orders were made, parenting time was generally granted to both parents, sometimes with the consent of mothers who had alleged abuse. Supervised access was ordered or left in place in very few cases, and access was denied outright in only one case, and in this case, the father was in custody as a result of a charge of assault against the mother. So these outcomes raise a general concern that in emphasizing contact, the impact of continuing exposure to domestic violence on a child's well-being and safety may be given inadequate attention, particularly during COVID, a period of elevated risk. So new slide, Jennifer. So there were a number of challenges that those who claimed to experience domestic violence faced in advancing their claims. Allegations of domestic violence are often denied or minimized or met with counter allegations. And because domestic violence uh, most often occurs in private settings, evidence that could corroborate the allegations is often not available. So during the time frame of our sample, the challenges in providing corroborative evidence were magnified and included increased difficulties in obtaining medical reports or getting third party affidavits sworn, delays in child welfare investigations, delays in assessments by the Office of the Children's Lawyer, which uh, would be interviewing children and obtaining their wishes, delays in custody and access assessments. Um, and when courts were faced with competing versions of events by way of affidavit evidence, uh, primarily or only, some judges simply found that there was a need for more robust or, quote, properly tested evidence and deferred a finding as to the domestic violence that had been alleged. In effect, however, this often meant that judges were deciding in favor of contact rather than caution until court hearings resumed at some point during at some point down the road. Um, judges are obviously in a difficult situation when faced with inconsistent affidavits and are reluctant to decide credibility only on that basis. But rather than having to make affirmative findings of abuse uh, at this stage, judges could scrutinize affidavits closely and look to whether there is on the whole credible evidence of significant risk. 
Finally, given a lack of access to supervised access facilities, a few courts met this challenge by relying on members of an alleged perpetrator's family to provide supervision. And this practice raises questions as to whether these family members would report problematic or harmful interactions with children even if they did occur. Um, remote access in lieu of in-person access was ordered in relatively few cases. A new slide, Jennifer. So just moving on to child protection cases. These cases arise where social workers have removed children from the care of their parents. And under most child protection statutes, children are acknowledged to be in need of state protection where they've been exposed to family, interpersonal, or domestic violence, as these are defined by those statutes or are likely to have been physically or emotionally harmed by it. Court directives also more readily acknowledged child protection matters to be urgent. For example, the Ontario Court of Justice included as urgent um, place of safety hearings, temporary care and custody hearings, status review hearings, restraining orders and secure treatment orders. So, um, now, during the time frame of our study, child protection matters were also more readily acknowledged than private family law cases to be urgent in court directives. Um, but we should note there were only eight child protection cases in our, uh, in our sample, and most of those, again, were decided by Ontario courts. Um, we know, however, that COVID-19 still had a serious impact on the handling of child protection matters over this period which as with many COVID-19 impacts, uh, disproportionately affects economically disadvantaged and marginalized and families. Um, so uh, note that in our sample of eight protection cases, none of the parties were identified as indigenous and only one party appeared to be racialized. Um, several cases involved parents who were alleged to have substance abuse or mental health issues. So now looking at this side, um, the challenges in child protection cases involving domestic violence during COVID-19, there are a number of ways in which COVID-19 increased challenges for survivors. Um, for children, there was the potential for reduced um, reporting of child maltreatment as a result of social isolation and the closure of day care and, and schools. In BC, there were delays in presentation hearings, which would review whether children were in need of protection after they had been removed. Two cases in Ontario illustrated further concerns in the early stages of the pandemic. Um, first, uh, children in both cases were removed and placed in state care, that is foster or kinship care, rather than being placed with their parents under supervision orders because social workers were working remotely, except for emergency situations, and were unable to provide effective supervision of parental care. Secondly, parents lost in-person visits with their children uh, in Ontario from March 16th until May 8th of last year because no drivers were available and foster caregivers were concerned about the transmission of the virus during these visits. Uh, in these two cases, the Children's Aid Society was given the discretion to determine when and under, under what conditions access would take place. Finally, there were reduced opportunities for parents to meet conditions uh, through counseling or parenting support programs that could facilitate the return of their children, again as a result of social distancing requirements or the closure of such programs. Um, Loss of these opportunities can make it harder for mothers to regain care of their children in the longer term. And of course, the longer these conditions persist, the greater these difficulties become. So while health risks to third parties in this context must be considered, these outcomes are, are presumptively at odds with the emphasis on parental contact that we, we saw in the family law cases. So I'll just pass this back to Jennifer. Thanks, Wanda. So I'm going to talk fairly briefly about uh, the criminal law cases in our sample. There were 15 criminal cases altogether. And unlike the family law cases, 
urgency was assumed in almost all of the cases in our sample. Uh, that's because all of the cases involved accused persons or offenders who were in jail. And in custody, criminal matters were generally classified as urgent by courts across the country. Uh, for the most part, the criminal cases in our sample in, uh, involved issues of either interim release or bail, or they were sentencing decisions. There was only one case which involved a decision regarding the urgency of holding a criminal trial. That was the Dallaire case from Quebec. And in that case, a court found that a trial should proceed urgently after reviewing a number of other factors or a number of factors, um, including the possible reluctance of the victim to testify. And, and she was an Inuit woman. Uh, and that was one of the few cases in our sample, actually, where the, the indigeneity or race of either the accused or the victim was mentioned. I also want to note one limitation with the criminal law research in our piece, and that is that our sample doesn't reflect the decisions that were made by uh, state actors such as police or crown prosecutors about whether to lay charges and whether to prosecute cases of intimate partner violence uh, during COVID-19. Um, so we're, again, only looking at cases that actually did go to court and, and were reported. So in terms of the challenges in the criminal cases uh, during COVID-19, um, it's important to note that for the two areas where most, most of these cases fell, bail and sentencing decisions, both of those areas of criminal law do explicitly require courts to look at intimate, intimate partner violence considerations specifically when they're balancing the rights of the accused on the one hand to liberty um, and the rights of complainants to safety on the other hand. So that's the normal situation in criminal matters. During COVID-19, courts were also called upon to consider the risks to accused persons of contracting COVID-19 in jail, um, in addition to other concerns presented by the pandemic, such as trial delays, harsher incarceration conditions, uh, and the difficulties in arranging housing and rehabilitation services for accused people when they were released from prison. And, and so those factors then had to be balanced with the concerns related to the complainant safety, including any enhanced risks due to the COVID-19 pandemic. In some cases, courts took the risks to victim safety quite seriously, although there's only one case where there was explicit recognition of the shadow pandemic and the increased risks to women of intimate partner violence during the pandemic. Uh, that's the Mitchell case mentioned in the third bullet point on the slide from Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, and this was a sentencing decision where the court considered the lack of availability of shelter spaces uh, to women during the pandemic as a relevant factor when sentencing the accused. As for the risks um, to the accused of, of contracting COVID-19 in prison, in many cases, judges required the defense to present evidence of a specific risk to the accused of, of that sort of enhanced risk. Um, but in other cases, courts did not require that kind of evidence and simply assumed a risk to the accused that ended up then factoring into their decisions on bail or sentencing. So for example, in the Rajan case mentioned in the fourth bullet point on the slide, the court described jail during COVID-19 as one of the most dangerous places imaginable, uh, which contrasted quite sharply with the muted attention that the court gave to the risk and harms of domestic violence in that case. And this was a case involving very serious charges of break, enter, and commit assault, death threats, and criminal harassment, um, as well as a discharge of a firearm into the complainant's home. We also see similar concerns in the Rajan case to those noted by Wanda in the family law realm, uh, where domestic violence is conceptualized primarily as discrete physical acts um, and sometimes uh, referred to as a mutual problem. So overall, in the criminal law cases, there was very little consideration of the COVID-related risk factors for domestic violence. Um, if we look at another sample of cases, um, they were cases involving civil protection orders or restraining orders. 
And it's important to know here that right at the outset of the pandemic, various international bodies recommended that states should take measures to ensure that women had meaningful access to emergency protection orders during the pandemic. Um, in Canada, most provinces and territories do have domestic violence protection order legislation, which allows victims of family violence to obtain EPOs without notice to the other party. Um, Alberta was the only province that actually uh, responded specifically to that international call, um, and that was by allowing applications for emergency protection orders to be, to be made by victims by telecommunication during the pandemic, whereas normally they have to apply in person or have an authorized person uh, apply on their behalf by telecommunication. And interestingly, this change in Alberta has now become permanent, which is a potentially good example of how the pandemic can provide the impetus for broader reform um, to legal remedies for domestic violence. Um, we did have a small number of cases involving EPOs in spite of that sort of enhanced accessibility in Alberta, so only one EPO case in our sample. And there was another 12 cases involving restraining orders from Ontario. Now, Ontario doesn't have its own uh, domestic violence protection order legislation, and so parties uh, seeking protection orders have to apply under family legislation. And for the most part, um, those kinds of protection order applications or restraining order applications were classified as urgent by the courts, either explicitly or implicitly. Um, but here again, we have fewer than expected reported decisions in spite of that recognition of the urgency of these kinds of matters. As far as challenges in this area are concerned, um, in the one reported EPO case, uh, which was out of Newfoundland again, um, the major challenge was with respect to the deficiency of the evidence from the perspective of the court. And so this was a case where the legislation in Newfoundland required EPO applications to be based on a sworn statement, and instead it came before the court as an application that was sworn by the applicant's counsel. And the court allowed the respondent's application to set aside that protection order, arguing that the evidence had not been presented in the correct way and, and didn't make any consideration for the difficulties of, of uh, mounting evidence um, due to the pandemic. Uh, the other observation from, from that case is that the domestic violence was minimized and the court said that emergency protection orders should not become, quote, a substitute for resort to the family court for issues involving custody and access of children. So an interesting interplay here between protection orders and the family court system. In the cases involving restraining orders, uh, for the most part, that wasn't the main issue in the case. These were typically family law cases where a restraining order was simply one of the, one of the different remedies that, that were being sought in the case. And in the one family case where the restraining order was a major issue, that was the Harrington and, and Dennison case mentioned on the slide, uh, there really weren't any issues um, that this was an appropriate case for a, a restraining order. It involved quite serious allegations of domestic violence while the mother was holding um, the infant. And so there's really not a lot that we can make out of the restraining order cases, since there's only one where it was really an issue. But it is interesting to note that in many of the cases, the courts looked at the potential of mutual restraining orders um, and mutually restraining the conduct of both parents rather than restraining the conduct of abusers more specifically. So that's an approach that also exists outside of the, the COVID-19 period, but I think it's important to recognize that it really does fail to recognize the impact of domestic violence on mothers and children, and um, we see no recognition in these cases of the increased risk, risk factors for domestic violence uh, during the pandemic specifically. So I'll turn it back to Janet now to conclude. Yes, and I'm mindful of the time, so I will wrap up quickly here, um, just with a few comments. Uh, so how did Canada fare? Back to our original question. We've just noted on the slide here some things that I, I think we would uh, describe as um, positive measures or steps uh, that were taken. Um, importantly, courts did remain partially open and triage principles did prioritize um, safety, including protective orders. 
Um, but I'll, I'll just leave you with a uh, um, few positive points and, and we'll move to the next slide, Jennifer. Um, but a whole range of um, concerns that we've identified. Uh, Wanda and Jennifer in their presentation, I think have touched on um, many of these. Hopefully you'll find this slide a useful summary of many of the concerns that they've already identified. So just um, a couple of um, observations. Uh, one is that um, our, our review of the case law suggests that many of the issues of concern are ones that predated COVID. And that's not surprising. Those issues of concern were not going to go away with COVID and not surprising too that many of them were amplified uh, during the period of COVID. Um, the uh, can issue that uh, Wanda and I have both spoken to earlier about the focus on the discrete acts of physical violence um, remains pretty entrenched. We now have new legislation in the Divorce Act. We have some new legislation provincially as well that um, suggests, or more than suggests, indicates clearly that um, our focus needs to be broadened um, to that coercive controlling framework. There's been a lot of other work that has indicated the really pressing need for judicial education and education of counsel around that conceptualization of domestic violence that the statutory changes alone will not go very far. Um, our research suggests, yes, indeed, a pressing need for that kind of education, um, but one that needs to now be expanded so that those actors in the legal system have a clear understanding as well of the COVID-specific tactics of coercion and control. Um, We've also, and I'll just move to the next slide, um, identified a, a large range of research questions that um, our uh, research, um, in some ways, for some of these questions, offers a little bit of insight, but some of the questions our research hasn't touched on at all. Um, I think as reflected in some remarks earlier, our focus on case law um, helps us to understand what's going on in the context of adjudication. But we know for so many women, uh, they're never going to access the courts. Um, they may get legal advice. They may not even get legal advice. So there's a lot more to be learned about what, what has been happening um, on the ground. And I think our next two speakers um, may uh, give us some additional insights about, about what that has looked like. There's a final slide as well, which just continues the, the research questions. And I know that you'll all have access to the PowerPoint later and we'll be able to take a closer look at those questions. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Jennifer, Janet, and Wanda for that excellent uh, presentation. Um, although most of your case law research was uh, not set within the prairies, I, you know, the information that you shared, I suspect, are quite relevant in the prairies. And uh, from our, our two next presenters, we'll probably speak to a lot of those. I also just want to quickly comment about your, you know, your, your questions for additional research. Resolve is actually carrying out um, a study looking at uh, the impact of COVID-19 on IPV survivors, intimate partner violence survivors, and service providers. And we're currently conducting that in Manitoba. And hopefully we'll get at some of those questions. So um, uh, folks, stay tuned for that uh, information. So I'm happy to um, introduce our uh, next two presenters. Uh, Zara Hosseini is a legal counsel at A Woman's Place here in Winnipeg, and she assists women who have been impacted by intimate partner violence and or family violence. She works alongside a multidisciplinary team that provides a wraparound service to women leaving abuse. Paula Ediger um, is a women's relationship counselor at uh, the Norwest uh, Co-op Community Health, where a woman's place is housed. She's been in the position for the last 12 years and works with women who have left or are contemplating leaving abusive relationships. Um, so welcome, Zara and Paula. Thank you. Thank you so um, much. I'm just going to take a second and share my screen. All right. 
Perfect. So thank you so very much for uh, being here today and uh, inviting us to speak. Um, we have just a, a short presentation around kind of what we're kind of seeing um, and what we're hearing from uh, the people that we work with and that kind of stuff. So uh, we will uh, uh, be uh, presenting for the next uh, couple of minutes. So COVID-19 and domestic violence, uh, sharing testimonials from the field. I'm Paula and that's Sara. Um, a Women's Place introduction. So a Women's Place is part of Northwest Co-op Family Violence Team and provides services in a multidisciplinary team setting. Um, we provide service to any um, and any and ind individual who is a resident of Manitoba or is currently physically present in Manitoba or, and uh, self-identifies as a woman. So women in our program have experienced or are experiencing uh, gender-based violence and, uh, and will often need supports as well. Um, the relationship can be either intimate partner or familial uh, relationships. Um, so who is our team? Our team consists of six social workers, one lawyer, one child therapist, two support workers. Um, we currently have team members who speak English, French, Tagalog, Mandarin, Polish, and Farsi. We also have team members who can uh, understand Portuguese and German. Um, for other languages, we have access to interpreters, including ASL interpreters. We are connected with multi-front line organizations, including healthcare providers, hospital, community resource centers, and women's shelters. So thank you so much for inviting us. Um, and before we go a little bit further, we'd just like to again say, um, why are we here? Um, so obviously we are, we acknowledge that we're at the same table as giants within this field, um, in the academic domain and also um, in practical terms. Um, we are not researchers, nor are we policy makers, um, but we are, we acknowledge that, hey, we are, specifically talking about what's happening in the field as it's coming to us. So we're sort of on the on the ground level. Um, so we, although we recognize that what we're sharing uh, may be correctly uh, categorized as anecdotal evidence, um, we are not running controlled environments, um, but we are hopeful that the reports that we're providing um, to the field, although they may not be conclusive, um, they may help the community at large uh, to further explore other avenues um, for a more rigorous, cohesive, or comprehensive analysis. We also acknowledge that gender-based violence, specifically in Manitoba, is prevalent in the Indigenous women's communities. We acknowledge um, the Indigenous women's organizations are doing an incredible amount of work to combat it. And we also recognize that um, their voices should be respected and sought out um, in these um, tables. Uh, and uh, we, yeah, that's, that's it. Thank you. Next slide, please. Um, okay, so some COVID-19 uh, observations uh, that we've kind of noticed is, first off, is the different levels of risk. Um, and uh, like our presenter said before, is that lots of these things were uh, present before COVID. However, now it's um, some of these have been amplified. So one of the things that we're seeing is the different levels of risk, which has made an impact, a significant impact on how we do our safety planning. Um, so, and what we know is that these things trickle down into the family court system. So um, significant amount of uh, unemployment or um, uh, employment uh, concerns which has had significant impacts on the child support payments, um, 
partners are now coming home more or working in the home or at home more, um, which has increased uh, stress on the relationships. Um, and so there is also, uh, we've also been noticing an increase of substance abuse. So which again, puts stress on the relationship. Um, uh, we've heard from folks who are now pressuring um, folks to use drugs or and or start drinking. Um, uh, some comments, for example, of you are now at home with me and not going to work. Um, so you should start drinking or you should uh, uh, have a beer or um, introduce drugs, um, which in a refusal, uh, which leads to arguing and conflict in the relationship. Um, and then there's also an increased uh, noticing of mental health coercion. Um, I will tell the courts that you're crazy you know that you're crazy. No one will believe you. If you leave um, more, uh, we're hearing a lot more uh, threaten, threatening of suicide. Um, so places to meet third party um, has kind of created uh, supervised visits and um, a loss, kind of a chaos of trying to find it, scrambling a third party for visits in with their children. So, um, for example, some like a Winnipeg access agency um, has uh, decreased or um, made different uh, arrangements. And so, or they've had a self-arranged third party and they have not been able to get out. And so, um, so it's been, uh, it's, it's been uh, left to the, to the people and finding and scrambling to find a third party for that. More recently, we've seen a threatening um, to get the vaccine um, versus not getting the vaccine in their children or um, with them so they could see their children. Um, those type of uh, uh, controlling behaviors. Um, schools um, uh, have been used as, uh, as a means of manipulation and control. So should kids, should the kids go to school or be homeschooled? Those type of questions. Um, you are a horrible mother if you send your kids to school during a pandemic. Um, which um, we know that they've um, been safer at schools. There, uh, these are some ways, of, uh, the different ways of controlling and how um, we have found that uh, partners have found different ways of controlling by using uh, COVID um, as uh, different means of uh, controlling and uh, manipulation. So access to services, we have seen that there was and there consistently continues to be just some delays and some confusion um, regarding access to services. So business hours were reduced, business hours were changed, um, partners were using this sometimes as a means to keep the kids. Um, so really the courts are um, really only taking urgent cases. Uh, so what you should really do is just do what I tell you, because uh, your access to justice is just not there. Um, so conversations like that were being uh, given privately. Um, so you won't be able to see a lawyer. So let's just do what I say. Um, over over the phone or virtual meetings, there was obviously safety concerns regarding that. But who was also listening in? Um, and there is uh, also a, a concern. Not only is the 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 phone or the the tablet itself safe um is there any applications on there that might be spying but there's also hey um my partner's in the other room um so uh, 
constantly being together, it is difficult to get uh, that space to talk. Uh, there's also a loss of respite. Um, so parenting supports, people that you would reach out to. Uh, at times, they were just family members were unable to help. Um, and then in-home supports for women with disabilities. Um, there was a lack of staff in regards to home supports. Um, protocols had changed. Um, so there was a, a partner who was abusive may at times be saying, hey, rely on me because all your other options have been cut off. Um, so uh, that's, again, um, a really difficult position for people to be. And then rural areas. Um, so some shelters uh, in, um, in the city, sometimes they were full. Um, and then when clients would reach out to um, rural shelters, there would be some talks about, hey, um, uh, right now our because we're in different rural areas, we're in different um, areas of the province, um, transport between us and you is, is not going to be recommended. Um, and the next slide, please. And barriers. So again, as we talked about uh, access to technology, um, children might be present in Zoom meetings. That's specifically problematic um, when children can understand what's happening. They're not a newborn child. Um, and there just might not be, um, there might be a, a possibility that information gets shared if children are there, but children are being schooled at home anyway. Um, there, parties may not have internet access, they may be unable to talk over the phone. Again, if they're on a family plan and uh, whoever gets the bill at the end of that will know exactly who you've called. Um, and especially now when there is less of an in ability to go out and meet with people, um, your, all your contacts and what your interactions are um, can be easily identified by phones. And then status of relationship. Um, there's a lot of questions being asked about how does someone leave a relationship when, uh, with their kids when their partner is always there, um, worries about going into a shelter uh, because of COVID-19 and having to have those interactions with people that you do not know. Um, and there is some uh, communications that we're having. Uh, you can leave, uh, but take the kids. Um, so a mom will say, hey, look, I'm, I'm afraid to take the kids outside of the home because uh, the world outside the home is less safe. We're consistently being told to stay in or um, they're told that you can leave, but the kids must stay. Um, so again, uh, there is that uh, fear of leaving and losing children. Next slide, please. So uh, observations in, in regards to legal, um, I will say that to Manitoba, um, COVID-19 came to our province a little bit later uh, than I would say Ontario. It, it moved much faster uh, in the bigger provinces, so Quebec and Ontario, um, and their cases um, were much more um, substantive and they came faster. So we did look at our, our bigger provinces um, to try and see, hey, how, how are we going to be consulting uh, with our clients and how are we going to resolve cases? Um, but there, in general, women have um, uh, had a preference to attend by telephone as long as they're not in the same physical vicinity as their abuser or they cannot see their abuser. So attendance to court um, is if the relationship is over, they have a safe place. Um, they're, they're very happy to not be in the same physical vicinity and have to come to court as the, um, the abuser. Um, there is a fear by some women of reprisal regarding safety if they should call into court from their home and their partner or their partner's family members know exactly where they are when they're making that call. Um, so it's quite different when you go into court and the sheriffs um, who are there um, and, and protecting you. Um, but some women are saying, hey, look, if I make this phone call, I'm in a rural area um, and I know who's going to be coming knocking if they don't really like what I was saying. 
there has been difficulty to resolve matters. So we have been encouraged significantly by the courts to hey, uh, try and resolve as much as possible. Um, but there are differing information coming uh, um, to different parties and parties are putting different weights. Um, so resolving issues can be quite difficult in, in the terms of the pandemic, especially when one party uh, feels like, hey, if, if I say no, um, that's going to reflect quite badly on me. Um, so there was a lot of confusion at the start of the pandemic regarding uh, physical attendance at court here versus telephone attendance at court here. Um, clients did uh, sometimes miss uh, court dates um, when they had to, and this increased their anxiety and their stress. Um, the courts have done amazing, amazing work um, to try and get that communication out there and it, um, but again, uh, sometimes uh, people are falling through the cracks. Um, there has been reduced court operations at the start of the pandemic, and this was stressful for clients, um, but it also resulted in an increase in access to justice initiatives, including sharing of legal information across multiple platforms, um, allowing rural Manitobans to have easier access to counsel and resources, and taking away the need that council would have to uh, drive up to uh, courts in rural Manitoba, that's helped them have easier access to council. Um, and also signing of documents, for example, under the Emergency Measures Act, uh, affidavits uh, <laughs> is no longer needed that the, you have to be physically present um, to be able to witness that signature. And then service, uh, we are also seeing that some clients are support, reporting that, hey, look, I'm now getting emails from the courts, from his lawyer. Um, service and notice by email is becoming much more prevalent. Some clients have found that really quite helpful in that they can now have a written document that they can share with their support network. And their support network is now available through email as well. Um, but other clients have said that, hey, look, um, uh, I thought I opened up my email and I was shocked. Um, it seems like the, the privacy has been breached because now you're saying things coming into emails consistently. Next slide, please. Sorry, Paula, next slide. Um. It's not going. <laughs> okay. No worries. Do you want to stop screen sharing and I'll screen share it on my side? Oh, oh there we here go. we go. Perfect. Let's go. All right. So in conclusion, we've got the good, the bad, and the ugly that we'd like to share. Uh, first of all, the good. Uh, new methods of reaching out for assistance have started. Um, to respond to client needs, including texting, social media, chat lines to reach out for support and creation of online programming and online telephone and telephone supports that you can connect to online. Um, women with certain physical disabilities are reporting an easier ability um, to access resources and remain in contact with the world at large. So for example, hey, look, I had to go down to legal aid um, to hand in these documents. Now I don't. I can scan it in and send it to this particular email. Um, hey, uh, my protection order, uh, I can actually do it over the phone as long as I have a protection order designate that was assisting me. I don't have to necessarily go down to the courthouse for some, uh, for some clients. Um, and then women who reported anxiety in going into new areas, especially where um, their abuser was physically present, um, they were saying that, hey, I, I, at least at home, uh, if I'm, I'm having that conversation, I can make sure um, that I've got some water next to me, that I'm in a place that I know, um, and afterwards I, I'm in a safe place. Um, the bad <laughs> is that women who need counseling um, are often in the same area as their abusers. So counseling is becoming very difficult um, to organize. So we are seeing that people, um, organizations are expanding their time that they're taking counseling um, to be able to kind of uh, 
find times where clients say, hey, he's going to be gone for this period of time. This is an area of time that I'll have. And uh, women in general are saying, hey, we're less visible in the community. Um, and they're also reporting that they're fearful that the children are less visible in the community. So you're having this argument, for example, going to school or um, before there was extracurricular activities and there, now there isn't going and seeing family members or friends. Um, that's not there. And then the ugly, um, we are seeing a prevalence of women who are frightened to leave home. So although they, they reach out, um, they say, hey, look, I don't have a reasonable excuse to leave home before I had shopping or I had to make a medical appointment. Now everything's done over the phone. Um, so there is a, a lot of fear about taking that first step that you need to. Um, we've also seen a prevalence of women saying that they're frightened at home, but it is the devil they know. Um, so outside is much, um, things are changing outside. Um, so the unknown uh, has become much more frightening. Uh, it's much less welcoming for people to take that step to leave. Um, we've also seen a drop of women uh, who didn't have access to technological means. So women who used a pay-as-you-go phone, uh, clients who relied on public Wi-Fi, for example, to connect, uh, clients without tablets or computers or cell phones. Um, in my work specifically, I've seen an increase of women uh, higher up on the socioeconomic scale. And again, we're, this is because of the prevalence of uh, domestic violence that it happens across the board of society. Um, but we are seeing that, hey, there's been um, some women who are not, uh, ha have, that, have that inability to access um, the same amount of resources because of a technological um, deficit. That's where we're seeing uh, a problem of missing women, I guess. And finally, uh, lower income women who worked in service in industries um, and they've lost their jobs. And with it, not only have they lost a reason to leave the home and be in a safer place when they're at work, um, but they've also lost their financial independence. Um, so they're very fearful um, about uh, what are the opportunities for them if they take a decision. Next slide, please. I'll just let you guys know that our next slide is coming, but I'll just let you know that we're just going to be saying, hey, we're definitely open for questions. Uh, uh, when Kendra says, uh, that when Dr. Nixon uh, opens it up for questions, and we're very thankful to have been here, and this is our contact information for the community at large, um, if you would like to, or you find that there is a client who needs to reach out. Thank you so much. Great, thanks uh, Zara and Paula uh, for that presentation. Uh, again, you identified some very um, concerning um, aspects that COVID-19 has, has brought in terms of women's experiences or survivors' experiences with intimate partner violence. But as you said, Zara, there have been, you know, other kind of more um, positive um, outcomes too in terms of greater access because of uh, technology. Um, so if we have uh, about five or so minutes for questions and answer uh, period, if people want to ask questions, I know a number of people have asked um, about sharing the slides. And uh, I know, Jennifer, you said that you would be, um, you, um, uh, Janet and Wanda will make your slides available. Uh, we can post those on the Resolve website and we have our URL on another slide in a, or in a second. Uh, and, and perhaps Paula and Zara, you can um, make your slides available to us so we can um, hand those out or put them on our uh, website as well. So just before we sure, begin- Yes, I believe Patricia has a copy. Okay, great, thank you. So we'll post on our website, thank you. Um, so there is one question coming in, but I'm just going to go over the Q&A guidelines first. Um, again, the Q&A option is at the in your menu bar. For me, I'm on a Mac and it's at the bottom. Uh, so if you have a question uh, or comment, please type it in there. And once I receive it, I will read it. Um, okay, so the first question, again, will, will the slides be shared? And I said, yes, we will do that on our website. Um, Olga Atwood asks, we know that there are no age boundaries when it comes to domestic violence research 
today has reflected on women and children during lockdown. Are older women the forgotten victims in this pandemic? I don't know if our presenters want to speak to that. Maybe, Perhaps. maybe I'll just chime in here quickly to say that I'm not aware of any cases in our sample um, involving older women specifically where that was identified as, as one of the factors. And, and I should also note that our, the focus of our research is not elder abuse. And so we may have used different search terms if, if we were trying to find cases in those areas. Yeah, and I suspect in family law, if you're dealing with, you know, children, you're not going to see that. But perhaps in the criminal or EPO restraining orders, there and obviously not child protection either. But I'm wondering if that as well, but not in the, the work that you did, I guess, with the criminal and the civil protection orders. Yeah, I can't think of, of having seen that specifically, but maybe maybe Zara and Paula have have some on the ground observations. Yes, for sure. Thank you. Yeah, I would just say anecdotally, um, we ha I have seen clients who are coming to me saying, look, um, I've been in this really abusive relationship for a really long time. Now it's gone much worse. Um, so we are seeing it that marriages of 25 years, marriages of 30 years where um, their children are grown. Um, so that isn't the issue. Uh, but the issue is that now uh, there is an over-reliance on your partner, especially when home uh, home caregivers cannot enter into the home. Um, so it, it continues um, and it gets to a point where anecdotally, at least I would say I've seen more. Mm -hmm. Okay. Paula, do you want to add anything to that? Not to put you on the spot, but I see you nodding. So no, I would just I would just agree with uh, Zara is that that we uh, we have seen uh, uh, an influx of the longer term uh, relationships uh, come and uh, come out and surface um, in terms of um, elderly women as well. Is that a lot of um, and it kind of goes, uh, it was kind of hand in hand with women in disabilities as um, um, with the pandemic, a uh, lot of their in-home supports um, with um, elderly women have um, uh, uh, dissipated or has changed hours and that kind of stuff. And so um, they've had uh, quite the struggle of accessing services. Um, but yes, we have seen um, uh, women um, of all ages. Thanks, Paula. Uh, I don't see another question, but I have a question. So this is uh, regarding on the, um, Jennifer, Wanda, and Janet, your presentation. Uh, I found it interesting, but I guess not surprising how you, um, I guess, recognized or identified the fact that um, in family law cases, there's this idea to kind of preserve contact uh, between the, the or promote contact between, or greater contact because it's COVID-19, right? Uh, we need to mitigate perhaps those effects. And so they're encouraging contact between parents and children, but yet we're seeing an opposite effect within the child protection cases, right? Where, um, you know, other concerns in terms of volunteer drivers and more, uh, you know, more focused on how the child protection system, mostly in Ontario, the children's aid system is able to function in a pandemic and the priority of families seeing their children, parents seeing their children seems to be kind of um, uh, a lower. So I'm just, interested you know I don't really have a question I guess just if you want to comment further Jennifer Janet and Wanda and I guess I would maybe like to ask in a little bit um, Paula and Zara if you're seeing something similar to that but first maybe Jennifer Janet or Wanda if you want to comment on that maybe I'll say a little bit to start I mean, with something I was going to address and, and we didn't have enough time. Um, we, we do in the paper make some observations about the differences we were observing across criminal family and child welfare, which is connected to the larger project that we're doing on access to justice and um, what happens when women and families are engaged with multiple areas of law, multiple legal proceedings simultaneously. Um, and I, I think, Kendra, you very clearly pointed out, like, one of the differences that we saw was the kind of 
readiness to sever particular kinds of parent-child relationships. That is in the child protection context where COVID is described in terms where, you know, you, you, you absolutely cannot expose a child welfare worker or a driver or, you know, so we'll end the birth parents' contact. In the family law context, and Wanda can speak more to this, there, there are cases where, you know, the child might be moving between two households, but each of those households is one with blended families. So in some of the households that the child is moving between, there may be three or four different adults and multiple kids who are also traveling between different households. Um, And one decision that I remember too, there's also yet another party involved who is the driver because the mom doesn't drive. And again, in those cases that, so the judges always say, you must strictly comply with the COVID protocols that doesn't comply with pro- the COVID protocols. Um, and but, but judges are, seem to be, though they speak the language of importance of compliance with protocols, seem so intent on preserving the access and the in-person contact that um, the COVID becomes somewhat d- diminished. And some of the criminal cases, I think Jennifer alluded to this, judges take judicial notice, others they want some proof, but the language about COVID in some of the criminal cases is quite alarming, like about just how dangerous it is. And we didn't find similar language in the family law cases. So um, we, we draw in the, uh, on in the paper work of um, Marianne Hester, who talks about, you know, these three different planets. Some other Canadian work talks about three silos, you know, get child welfare and family and criminal um, with different objectives, um, different conceptualization of domestic violence, and very, very different approaches to um, thinking about uh, risk and about contact between parent and child. So I think that's a very interesting area to explore more fully and deeply. And then, you know, again, what happens to women and to children and families when they're involved in those multiple systems simultaneously? Wonder Jennifer or Paula Zara might have other thoughts about that too. Yeah, I can um, just add to that that um, we certainly did see a different emphasis just uh, in each area of law. And uh, in the family law context, you get that incredible normative pull towards contact with both parents. Um, And in some of those cases, uh, judges were not closely examining the social distancing or the compliance with COVID protocols within each household. Um, And so that was, I think, of of some concern as, as Janet pointed out. But this normative hold that maximum contact has, I think also reflects the uh, somewhat of a sort of the, our attraction towards a nuclear family model and, um, you know, which is obviously restructured in the post-divorce context. Um, But I think judges still think of this as a post-divorce family unit that they are trying to preserve. I think... I mean, yes, we, we have seen the decisions be different. Uh, I know that uh, colleagues who work in child protection, uh, they were going in and saying, hey, look, let's look at family law. What's happening there? <laughs> They're having contact. Please allow our clients to also have contact. And the response was quite resounding as a no um, to them. Um, so, but I think one of the things that, it, and I'll, I'll defer uh, to the more experienced uh, members of the panel, but we have, we have state actors in child protection, we have it in criminal law here and state actors in the civil case where we see it in child protection are given quite a lot of respect. Um, But here we have two, in in family law, we have two private individuals. Um, And that's where uh, we consistently have to say, hey, look, although uh, she is a private individual, she is the one bringing this case forward. This is a cumulative experience of all Canadians. so that's uh, that's where we we end pretty much um, to try and make that argument. Um, but it is again, she is not a state actor. Um, her resources are much more limited. Um, so I think that's that's where we <laughs> that's where we are. Yeah, 
Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm just mindful of the time. It's uh, just after 4.30, so we probably should wrap up. Again, I want to thank all of our presenters uh, today for those great uh, two presentations. We will be posting um, the webinar, the recorded webinar, and the slides on the Resolve website, which we have uh, listed below, as well as our social media. So if you haven't connected with us on social media, please do so. At the bottom of the screen also, you will see um, the uh, URL for the Alliance Project. That is the community of practice project of which this webinar is um, uh, based on. Again, looking at promoting health and well-being within the family law sector. So if you're interested in, in hearing more about that project, please uh, go on to our website. Next slide, Patricia. Again, I just want to thank all of our uh, presenters and um, Patricia and others who helped out with the uh, technology, uh, Josh uh, at the University of Manitoba, and I would like to thank all of the registrants today um, for being interested in this work. Um, Patricia will be sending out a survey uh, shortly after today's presentation. Uh, it shouldn't be a long survey, just takes a few minutes to uh, complete it. Uh, if you can do, do that, that would be great. Again, um, as part of the uh, Public Health Agency of Canada funding, we need to evaluate all of our webinars. Um, so with that, I, we can say goodbye and I want to thank everybody for uh, attending and we will put um, everything on our website, including um, we are writing a research brief based on this webinar. So stay tuned uh, for that as well. Again, uh, thanks everybody and take good care.